Hey guys, today we'll be creating this contact form in PHP where communication is done asynchronously, which means that we could actually send an email without a page refresh. But currently, these errors will appear because we haven't actually filled out these fields. And as you can see, when we did press send, these errors displayed without a page refresh. So we'll just enter in some dummy content here. And we'll change this so we can get a new error now where this isn't a valid email format, which is the, meant to be the recipient's email. As you can see, we're getting that error now. And just to show you that this actually does work, because we will be setting up an SMTP server for free using Gmail, so that we can actually send emails. We'll paste in the temp mail there, and then we'll press send. And again, notice that it's send, and we get notified with this uh, success message, but the page never refreshed during that entire process. And just to show you that the email has actually been sent, we can go back, and just in time, it actually does appear. As you can see, the subject dummy, subject, the bolt of the body is the same as the subject. So if this interests you, then keep watching. So here we are in a new empty project folder. Because we are using PHP, we will need to be running an Apache server to host our files locally. I have mine via XAMPP, but you can set up yours manually if you want. Either way, it doesn't matter as long as you do have one running. And because I'm using XAMPP, the project is located in the HG Docs folder, which is XAMPP's default web folder. And inside my project folder, I will launch up a terminal, and then inside I will use the terminal to launch up VS Code, which is my source code editor of choice, but obviously you can use whatever source code editor that you want. We will start off by creating the index.php file. It will be served to the client as soon as they try to access the home page root. Therefore, we will use it to hold all of our markup content. And inside, we'll use the emit abbreviation to create the HTML boilerplate code. I'll zoom in so that you can see that a lot better. And we will give this a title. And we will create a header so that we can display something other than a blank screen. And before we check to see what this looks like, we will create the style sheet for this page and we will create it in its own folder so that we can separate things out of it. We will call it styles.css. And the first thing that we will do is we will just configure some default styling. So box sizing border box will include elements and margin and padding in their final width and height values and we use asterisk selector to select all elements and then we will remove all of the margin and padding from all of the elements and then set the font family and now that we've created this we will just link to that style sheet like so but obviously it's in the css folder so we'll need to link to it like that css style it's actually styles.css and then now we will go to our browser and then we'll try it out localhost i think it was called ajax email so we'll need to go to that that was what the project folder was called. As you can see, it's in the correct font, so we know that things are working. So we'll go back to our VS Code now. And we will now begin creating the contact form. And we will create it using the BEM or block element modifier design pattern. I won't be explaining it in this tutorial, but I will post the link in the description for you to learn about it if you don't already know. But essentially, it is just a set of naming rules for CSS classes. And we'll remove the action because we don't need it. And we'll also say, we'll also turn off autocomplete because I just find it annoying to be honest. So the, so none of the inputs will have suggestions, but obviously that's, up for, that's your choice whether you want this to be enabled or not. And the first thing that we will do is we'll create a label and it will be for an input of name. It will say two, when now we'll create the input and it will be a text input. So we'll create it like that. As I said before, it have a name of two, and then we'll use BEM to give it a class, and that will be the name of the block, which is email form, but the name of the actual element itself is text. And this use of double underscores is the standard syntax for BEM. Again, I won't be explaining BEM in this tutorial, but rest assured that this is the proper naming convention for elements. It's the name of the block followed by two underscores and then the name of the actual element that we want to target. And then we'll create another label and then another text input. And again, that will have 
a name that corresponds to the label and we don't want to ha give it an ID we'll just give it a class like so its name will be subject oh wait sorry not yet yeah, like type text your name we don't want to change that create one more label that will be for message add it like so and instead of a input this will actually be a text area and its class we want to give it its own unique class that will be email form and it will be a different element so underscore underscore text area its name will still be message and we'll finish this off actually with a button and that's a button of type submit again using emit abbreviation here and again that will be its own element so say email form submit and the text inside will just say send okay now we'll move on to styling this stuff so because it's not a real website we can just set the body to be display flex normally I wouldn't do that normally I'd have some kind of container class but the only thing it's not a complex UI the only thing that's actually on this uh, web page will just be the header and the contact form so we can afford to get away with that so height it will be 100 viewing height but it can't be any smaller than 500 pixels and this will simply prevent the contact form from going outside the top edge of the document and we will center everything on both axes so justify content and align items both of those will be center flex direction will be column so elements will go from top to bottom not horizontally and then the title which is what we gave the header I believe yep again we'll just give it some margin on the bottom to counteract the fact that we removed or every element's uh, margin in the asterisk selector which is the first selector that we created and then the email form which is remember the block that was the actual form element which contained the two inputs and the uh, text area we'll give it 10 pixels uh, vertical padding 20 pixels horizontal padding give it very thin black border give it some margin so that it's 100% width but it can't get any larger than 500 pixels so on screen sizes where that are smaller than 500 pixels it will be 100% the width except not really because we have padding uh, on both horizontal sides so it'll be a bit away from the edge of the viewport and oh, we should probably check this out actually because I, I just realized you haven't actually viewed it so yeah a problem that I have here is that because inputs and other form elements are display inline by default it's being displayed horizontally here but we want them to be displayed uh, in a column so vertically and the way that we will do that is we will simply target every direct child of the email form like so and then we will set the display to be block and also give some vertical padding as well and so now we refresh as you can see it's displayed vertically now so that's how we get that effect we will now target the input of the form the two inputs because remember we had two inputs and one text area so this is for the two inputs but as for the text area email form and the name of the actual element so text area 100% the width of the container give it padding 10 pixels all around height have a fixed height 120 pixels and we'll set resize to be none so that the user can't drag the size of the text area around so now if you look see what this looks like as you can see it's looking good we will now begin to create the classes for the message elements they aren't actually hard coded into the markdown file because they will only be displayed on a relevant scenario like an error being met or the email being sent successfully but you saw a demonstration um, at the start of the video what those messages look like, it's like the error messages this particular class will be applied to the message that appears at the top of the contact form and it isn't related to a specific input 
and again you saw at the start with the green success message we will then create some modifier uh, classes for this class and in BEM the naming convention for modifiers is the elements class followed by two hy hyphens followed uh, by the name of the modifier so in this case the name of the actual modifier is a uh, and it will be applied to this element class so it will have color of red because this will be the error messages for that uh, for this message at the very top of the contact form and the other one will be it will be the success message so it will have color of green next we will create the class that will be applied to the error messages that are related to a specific input and these messages will contain things like this input cannot be left empty etc and we won't create any modifications for these they will all be error messages which is why it's just a set uh, color of red as for the button we want that to have some padding so I'll give it some padding we also want it to be centered horizontally in the middle of the contact form something that we could achieve with margin auto for both horizontal sides thanks to us making or direct children of the contact form display block earlier on which is what we did up there and so now again we refresh we are well the button will be styled but the messages obviously they won't make any difference because the messages will actually be rendered onto the contact form they're not there by default finally we will decrease variation between browsers by manually writing out our own styling for these form elements now browsers set their own styling for form elements and this styling can vary between browsers so by manually defining our own styling we are overwriting the browsers default ones so font size 100% and font family will be inherit so I don't know if you can see that the form has actually changed slightly and it, now, it will now look consistent across all browsers we now want to create the front end scripting for index.php file so that we can make the initial post request to our server. So at the bottom of the body, so it's that the last thing to be loaded, we will link to a script and it will be in its own scripts holder. And it will be called email for email form.js and we'll create that in the scripts folder as specified and then email form .js like so and inside the first thing that we want to do is we want to create a reference to our contact form so that we could do something when the user submits it and we could use the query selector to do this because we only had one instance of this email form class in our DOM so we could just target it like so and I need to show you an error so if we press if we just go to the root and we press send, as you can see you get directed to this weird URL root and the page obviously refresh, refreshes to send us there. And we don't want this because we're sending an asynchronous uh, request. We don't want the page to uh, refresh because that would just defeat the whole purpose of having of sending asynchronous requests where the page doesn't refresh. So the way that we will prevent the page from refreshing on form submit is we will configure the on submit event handler for the form and it has access to the events through this through its argument which we've uh, just called a and inside we could co inside we could write code that will be triggered when this form gets submitted and the first thing that we will do inside is we will prevent the page from refreshing using the event argument combined with the its prevent default method and this will do it exactly as described by our comment so we, we just press send so if we refresh, uh, as you can see, press send now, and the page is no longer um, the page is no longer sending us anywhere, which is good. It's just staying where it is. And after this, we will create references to the free inputs on the contact form. So we'll say email form.querySelector to query all of the child 
element uh, of the email form and the first input had a name of two so we will just target it like that because remember they had all they had all the same classes so we will target it individually using an attribute selector and then we'll do a similar thing here but I believe its name was subject that was the second input and then as for the message input well that wasn't an input that was um, a text area so we'll say text area and there wasn't any other text areas so just writing out text area would suffice but anyway we'll be a bit more specific and we will include the attributes and value we'll then move on to actually creating a post request and we'll do that using fetch API because it's gotten to a point now where it's supported widely enough for us to be able to use it Obviously you don't have to use it, you can use the traditional uh, Ajax object or you can use jQuery if you want. Again, you could find out how to do that on your own. It's not really an Ajax tutorial, it's more of a uh, PHP tutorial really. How to create contact forms uh, and send emails in PHP. And it's very important that on the second argument of this fetch request that we include this headers content type uh, field and we need to set its value to application slash JSON, very important because we are sending JSON data to our server. If we didn't include this content type header, then we wouldn't be able to do that. And also, it's absolutely essential because we're using Apache server that we include this mode and credentials field because they allow us to send a uh, request that is to be handled by the same local server that sent the request in the first place. Must the body, the data that will be held on this post request, we use json.stringify because again we are sending JSON data. And we will have three fields that will represent the three uh, fields, the three inputs of our contact form. So two subject, subject input.value got value because we want to send over the values of these inputs not the actual input elements themselves again we'll do it for the third one and then after that we will need to write to them method so when the server when we get response from the server the server's response data will need to be passed from JSON into JavaScript so that we can work with it in JavaScript and then once that's finished passing, we will simply console.log res just for testing purposes so that we know that the server uh, is, can respond to our request. And because we are sending a request to send email form.php in the libraries folder, we we'll need to create, first of all, the libraries folder. And then inside, we need to create that PHP file verbatim. So make sure that it's named uh, exactly how it was written here and inside we're only going to contain PHP code so we could just write the opening PHP tag like so and we don't need to write a closing tag so the purpose of this file is to handle the client's post request and respond to it by sending the email if there are no errors the first thing that we will do is make sure that this file is being requested in the correct way and we want to make sure that it is being requested from a post request that has the correct headers set before we begin to run the email sending logic. And to do this, we'll get access to the value of the content type header that we created in the second argument of the fetch method. And I don't know if you remember, but it was called content type. Uh, so we get access to it in this server super uh, global and to prevent an error, we will use a turning operator and we will first make sure that the value does exist. We're using the isSet method, which is built into PHP. If it does exist, then we'll get access to it with the trim method. And the trim method will just use, um, it will remove unnecessary white space. So it will just simply streamline our code. But if it doesn't exist, then we will simply assign content type to be an empty string 
to prevent any null errors. And this if condition will be met if the content type is what we set it to be on the second argument of the fetch method. So inside of this if condition, we will be safe to create the email sending logic inside of here. And the first thing that we will do inside is get access to the data containing the body of the client's post request. We do that with this file get contents method and specify that we want the input data. Remember, this should be a JSON object with three fields two for the two input and one for the text area. Again, we will use the trim method for this. It is very useful for removing discrepancies in our input data. Now our PHP can't actually work with JSON objects. So to handle input data, we will need to convert it into a format that is native to PHP. And we can do that with this JSON underscore uh, decode method. The first argument is the JSON object that we want to pass. And the second configures the pass JSON data to be a PHP associative array, not a PHP object, which is what this true boolean does. And this if condition will be met if the passing process was successful. For now, the only thing that we'll do inside is we will use this exit method to stop the script immediately as soon as this if condition is met because we want to see if the server can successfully respond to the initial post request or not before we do anything else. Now the exit method allows us to stop the script from exiting and return a value. The value that we return must be passed into JSON with this JSON encode method. If it wasn't, then the client wouldn't be able to receive this data from the server. And for now, we will simply send back the decoded associative array passed back into JSON so that the client should essentially get back whatever they submitted to the form in the first place. And if we go back to the form, remember we're logging it, so we should be able to now, we'll just uh, refresh this just for luck. So we just had some data here, you know, whatever. Press send, obviously nothing should happen at the moment, but we should, if we go to console.log, we should actually see that the data is formatted here. So we know that things are working. So we can go back to our PHP file. So now that we know the server can respond properly, we don't need its exit method anymore since it was only for testing purposes. Instead, we want to loop through the associative array each item in the associative array, which there should be three in this case, will have the key represented by this name iterator and the value represented by value. Inside, we will simply overwrite the value of the item that is currently being looped through with the previous value passed into this filter method, uh, filter var method, which I'll create now. As you can see, its second argument will be set to be configured um, to remove any characters uh, from this input data that is not suitable for the string format. And we will wrap the output of this method in a trim method so that we can be dead certain that every value in this array is properly formatted, ready for error checking, which is what we'll do later on. So we'll close it off with semicolon. The first check that we will make is if the to field on the associative array holds an empty value. If it does, then we will need to somehow render an error message above the to input on the contact form, informing the user that they need to fill out this input. And to do that, we will create this associative array in global scope. All of its field correlate to different messages that can be rendered out on the contact form. 
They are initialized to empty strings because they will only hold values and we need to show a message to the user, like an error message, for example. As you can see, you should be able to know where we're getting these names from, or at least some of them, because they, they are the names of the input originally. Close it off like so, so we don't get an error. And we initialized it in global scope so that we can render out an error message to the user if the parent if condition wasn't met for any reason. So outside of this parent if condition, we will simply initialize the top error field of this array, this global associative array. And we will write out a message like so. And as soon as we initialize this top uh, field, we will return this array to the user. Remember, it needs to be encoded into JSON. As for this scenario, we will initialize the to uh, field instead. And the error, the, well, the message will need to be relevant to the actual error condition. And we won't immediately return the response here because there are still more errors to check for. Like, for example, if this to-do is not empty, then there's still a chance that it is not formatted properly for an email. And we'll be able to know that if we use this filter var method and we say filter validate. So we're not sanitizing here, we are validating. So this method will return false if it's not in the correct format for an email, in which case we will need to create a new message that relates to this specific, specific error message. So we'll say it must be a valid email instead of empty. As for the other two error messages, they are a lot simpler. For them, we would only throw an error if the user has failed to input any data for them. And in this case, these conditions will even be met if the user has inputted multiple white spaces in them because of the trim method that we used uh, in the above for each loop. Actually, we'll just copy this because it's the same message but just assigned to a different field. And we'll do the same for the other one as well, the message. Let's copy the string from here though. Now, if the user gets to this point in the if condition where they have passed all of the error checks, then we want to begin sending the email. However, if they get to this point and one of the one or more of the above error checks are met, then we want to stop the script here and now because we only want to send an email if the user has passed through every single check without an error. We can do that by looping through the response associative array, like how we looped through the associative array above. And if any of the value, if um, if any of the values in this array are not an empty string, then we will stop the script and return the response immediately, so that any code below will not be executed. So we'll say exit if that condition is met on any of the values contained inside this associative array, and we'll just return the response like we always do. Now, if we get to this point here, then we'll actually need to send the email. And to do that, we will need two things, an SMTP server and a mail function in PHP. So as for the actual SMTP server, you will need to go to your Google account. Just type in Google account. Go to it here, and then once you've signed in, you'll need to go to, I believe, security. And then you'll need to enable two-step verification. I've already enabled it here. 
And then what you'll need to do, once you've enabled two-step verification, you'll need to go to app passwords. And then obviously you'll need to uh, sign into your account. I'll just jump cut to when I've done that. Okay, once you've entered in your password, you'll need to go to select app, you choose custom, and then you type in whatever you want. I'll just type in test123 because I've already generated my password as you can see. But all you need, once you've generated it, you'll need to copy this. Make sure it's very important that you keep a record of this. Because once you press done, you won't be able to see it again, but then you press done. But I'll delete it personally because I'm not, I'm not going to be using that. I'm going to be using the one that I've already created. So once you've created that and you've stored it, haven't deleted it, and you've noted down the password that it gave you, you will need to go to PHP, Mailer, <coughs> and then you go to the GitHub, which should be the first link, depending on what search engine you use. Click on download this, and then you download it into your project folder, or wherever really, because it's just a zip. And inside your project folder, you will need to rename this, just for ease. So I'll rename it, just to PHP mailer, and then you just drag it into your root, or whatever you want really, just as long as it's in your project folder. You can delete the zip now. And now that we've got that, that's good, we actually need to go back to documentation because it's some important information that we can copy from her such as if we scroll down this, all these uh, imports are required in order for you to use a PHP mailer inside this document so we'll copy it like here but we will change some of this you see we're, in, we're currently in the libraries folder so we we'll need to go to the root directory where PHP mailer is actually contained in but other than that we can keep the rest the same and what we'll now need to do is we'll now need to initialize PHP Mailer. And to do that, we'll go to the PHP Mailer documentation, scroll down to this section, and we will instantiate it in a variable called mail. We'll do that here actually. And we don't actually need the boolean there. And then we'll just copy some of this, but not all of it. We don't need to copy all of it, just the stuff that I've highlighted. We'll delete this just because comments aren't really important. It kind of interferes with the word wrapping that we've got here. And as for these values, obviously these are just dummy content. The actual values for our SMTP server will need to be filled out in this HT access file so that we can declare some Apache environment variables, which is how we will be storing our SMTP information because since it is private, we don't want others to be able to view it. And the way that we do that, we do with set env, capital S, capital E. And every single uh, one, we'll need, to, we'll need to begin a HTTP. And instead of spaces, we'll have underscores. And everything will need to be in capitals. So this one will say PHP mail host. Now, by default, no matter what your password was, if you're using Google's server, it will be smtp.gmail.com and then we'll declare another one again the same if you're using the service it will be 587 and that's a number which is the reason why we didn't include quotations and then username Again, this will just be your email address, your actual Google uh, email address. And then as for the password, that will need to be the password that you copied, or that you should have copied anyway. If not, then you'll need to repeat the step of setting up a an SMTP server password. I'll need to blur this out because this is actually sensitive information and I definitely don't want other people to be using that. But once that we've got that, we actually need to create a dot git ignore uh, to spot that right, there you go, file so that this ht access file can be ignored if we do decide to push this project to a git repository so inside we'll just say ignore that file and if we didn't do this then others will be able to view this ht access file from our git repository and that would 
simply defeat the whole point of environment variables of having them in the first place and with all this created I actually need to use these environment variables so that what they, they will be contained inside of the server super global so actually we'll go back and we will copy all of these copy them like so again I'll remove these because what you know, it doesn't really matter so we don't need them and actually I'll just cut to having all of these filled out so hold on a second there is uh, actually another thing that I forgot to include and that's the port very important because remember it was 587 so we'll include it here inside that whoops well, it needs to be on all caps for starters but we'll just include that now like so and actually all of this will need to be surrounded in a try catch block just in case there is an error in initializing PHP mailer we'll need to catch that exception and inside the catch block we will actually copy this and paste it in uh, here so that the user we can just send back uh, a header error message to the user to be displayed on the contact form if there was an error in initializing uh, PHP mailer and one thing we'll actually restart Apache server just to make sure that these environment variables should be working uh, properly but anyway we will now scroll down to remember where, where we were before below this for each loop and this is, we'll get to the point now where we actually do send the email. So we'll do that in a try catch block. So the set from, this will be who the email is from. And that can just be your email address that you used to create the SMTP uh, email address because it wouldn't really make sense to use anything other than that. Subject, again, well, we'll get that from decoded. Like so, and then we'll say mail is HTML. This is kind of an option, and we'll set that. So we'll, yeah, we are using HTML. You'll see why in just a second. Because the body, which is what the message's contents will actually be, it will be in a paragraph. Uh, whoops. So we'll close it off like that and we use four stops to concatenate everything together and decoded we'll say message we'll go inside we sandwiched in between those two paragraphs and then after that we will say add address and this will be the recipient of the email and the recipient obviously again we'll get that from decoded and then finally we'll say mail dot send and it should be pretty self-explanatory what the send method actually does and then again we need to catch this if there was an error then we will do what we always do because there was a problem okay well this add address uh, oh yeah because it needs double D there you go solve that error and then if we get to this point where the catch block obviously wasn't met because if it was met then the exit method would, would be met and the script would just terminate we'll say the sex success response so we can mark what we're actually doing and inside the response we'll say success message has been sent like so, add a full stop, and then finally we'll do what we always do, send back, J send back JSON uh, encode response, and we should actually be done um, with our PHP uh, send email form file, we'll now go back to our JavaScript file, and we'll get rid of this console.log because we don't actually need it anymore, or actually you know, we could keep it to be fair because it's not going to do us any harm. It's good for testing purposes, I guess. And obviously, I'll move it on a finished application, but this is not a finished application. So, if the response is holding data on its 2R field, then we will need to render out whatever it is holding on that field as an error associated with the 2 input on the contact form. And the way that we do that is we will use insert a json html method and 
the before again method which will mean that the HTML content of this method's second argument will be inserted directly before the opening tag of the element that this method is being used on and in this case that is the to input element and what will you we'll actually use back ticks because you want to use string concatenation here as you can see we're ending out a paragraph and the paragraph being displayed will uh, well the paragraph being rendered will display whatever string is held in this to our field so we will say to our like so and we'll need to give it the relevant class so we'll say class email form uh, msg remember we created that uh, a while back but we will need to give it that class and we'll need to do the other ones as well so what we'll say We'll just copy them just for brevity. And what was the name again? Subject. I think we'll leave it as yeah, subject. Uh, so we'll just change that. Change both of them at the same time. You can do that by holding down Alt in VS Code. Change it like that. And um, yes, this one needs to be changed as well. So we'll say we'll change it to subject input. And then one more. And this one needs to be message. Uh, oh no, I didn't highlight the second one this time. Oh well. Message. Uh, and this one, this one needs to be message input. And it will also need to have a different class. And that will be email form. Actually, no, it won't need to have a different class. So that will be as it is. But we, what we will do is we'll say we'll do the one for um, the top. Uh, and if this top uh, field holds a value, then the HTML content will be inserted as the very first child of the email form. And this will be, um, sorry, this will need insert adjacent HTML. And this will be configured with after begin, like so, so not before begin this time. And inside, again, we'll use back ticks. like so and inside we'll render out top error and it will have a different class this time the actual class that it will hold will be uh, email form top msg and it will need to be red so we'll copy that and it will use the red modifier so remember if you remember then it will double hyphens and then error like so and after this, this we will render out the success message but we can't do that if there are any other error messages that exist so if any of these error messages do hold a value then we will simply return out of this callback function immediately so that the success message never has a chance to be of, of being outputted So we'll simply say return, again we use word wrapping here, and then finally, again we'll just copy this just for ease, we'll actually render out the top success, and that will be, again that will be after begin, and instead that will be, obviously this will be top success, and then this will be, instead of er, uh, it will need to be success, well I had a semicolon there, just because uniformity. And in addition to that, we will also reset the form so that its free inputs will be wiped clean of values. And this will simulate the effects of a page refresh without actually refreshing the page. And we'll do that with the, I don't know why auto corrected, because that's a valid method, as you'll see. With the reset method, like so. So we'll actually try this out. So we'll go to our application, but we'll refresh. So if we press send now, as you can see, we're getting errors. So if we fill out this information now, as you can see, we, we, get, we have a problem here. And the problem is we are not wiping these error messages. 
uh, on a new form submit. So the way that we'll do that is we will create a function called remove all messages from form. Whoops. And what we'll do, we'll target the whatever form is passed into the method, and then we'll use the pre-selector all method, and we'll target every single element that contains MSG in, in its class name or any of its class names that has multiple class names and because we're using for each it will return an array and we'll loop through every single one of these elements that match the criteria and we'll simply remove it from the DOM and this will work because all these messages they have MSG as you can see hyphen MSG hyphen MSG uh, yeah, they've all got that. They've all meet that criteria, so all these will be removed on a new form submit. And obviously, we'll need to call this. So this will actually be the first thing that will be called, and we'll pass an email form so that actually works. And so now, if we refresh, oh no, we get an error, but we type in information here. We should get a different error. It must be a valid email address. So we'll get a valid email address, so we'll go to whoops, temp mail, I don't know why, sorry, temp mail, we'll just go to this one, quickly get one, again copy that, paste it in here, okay that's now valid, email, and we'll just say dummy, one, two, three, A, B, C, and then hopefully, success, message has been sent, everything's cleared, let's see if it actually is working, we refresh here, and hopefully if we wait a bit we should actually uh, get a yep so I was a bit hesitant then for a second but as you could see we are actually getting uh, a message and yeah everything's looking good obviously you know I mean this looks good to me um, if you have any queries or if my explanations were lacking in some areas then please don't hesitate to post your queries down in the comments box below I would be happy to hear back from you and I will answer all of your questions to, to the best of my ability and I'd also appreciate if you like and subscribe because I put in quite a lot of effort into making these tutorials and you'll be doing me a huge favour if you did that but more importantly have a great day and peace out guys